Good morning and happy Mother's Day to all the wonderful mothers here. Um, I have a little story I'm going to share. And um, so this is the day that something we all have in common. We all have mothers. And um, so that's pretty fun. But I wanted to share with you, some of you guys have uh, gifts that you've given your mom. But I want to share with you like the most amazing gift I ever got. So if you've forgotten to give your mom a gift, this is an idea. Okay, so one day I got this card and I opened up the card. And inside the card was um, uh, a thing that they love me and that they were going to pray for me every day for the next every day for the next year. And when I read that card, I was so overcome with emotion. I felt like something holy was in the air. I had to close the card and I put it down. And I'm like, I don't deserve that. I don't deserve that. And then I opened it up again, and just kind of tears came out because. For you guys, um, the children out there, when you pray for us moms, because you know we love you, and you, you know we're not perfect, but when you guys pray for us, that is the most powerful gift, the most amazing gift that you can give. So, if you haven't given your mom a gift, that's like a really amazing idea. I just wanted to encourage you guys to share share that with you. Um, and so, if everyone wants to rise, we're going to sing. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The ninth day of May, I also would like to say Happy Mother's Day. Uh, to start off, would you bow with me in prayer? Loving Father, Lord, we thank you for, again, all of the women in this church. We thank you for the mothers and all that they go through. Lord, we know that they have worries about kids that last forever, that could be in the, when they're born, and they're still worrying about them when they're 40 years old. So, Father, we just pray about these many loads and the many hats that they wear. Uh, we thank you, Father, 
for the gifts that you give them that no one else can fulfill. And Father, we just pray that you would give them strength and wisdom, that you would protect them, that you would give them discernment. And Father, we pray that you would give them joy in all the roles that they fill. And we pray, Father, also that they would continue to reflect your love. We thank you, Father, for the good weather. We thank you for the moisture. Um, we just pray for a good growing season, for good weather. We pray for protection over these crops. And now as we gather this morning, Father, I just pray. I think of the words of Stephen Curtis Chapman in his song where he says, My Redeemer is faithful and true. Everything he has said he will do, and every morning his mercies are new. We thank you, Father, for this morning's mercies. We pray that you hear our songs of praise. We pray that you hear our prayers. We pray, Lord, that you hear our cries as we bless you with these many things. And bless us with your words this morning from Matthew. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>
singing. Mr. Ryan speaking, that it could be from you and your presence would be welcome before. Pray for this morning. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to everyone, particularly the mothers. As we go into a time of prayer, um, just a couple things. First of all, um, over the last few years in particular, uh, we have shifted our Mother's Day celebration at Scandia a little bit away from actual biological mothers and go toward a celebration of the fact that God put ladies in the church. And that's because this isn't a happy day for everybody. I mean, there's some that would like to be mothers and can't, and there's um, some that didn't have great mothers, and there's others that are actually grieving the loss of their mother. And so we know that this is kind of a bittersweet day for everyone. I want to read a prayer of Hannah before we go um, into our time of prayer. Hannah is actually uh, the reason why I have a daughter named Hannah. Prayed over her many times that, uh, that she would be a woman like Hannah in the Bible. So if you want to read Hannah's story, go to 1 Samuel chapter 1 through 3. You get the whole story of Hannah and what kind of a mother she was. She had um, a lot of, um, of heart pain in her life. Very difficult time. She couldn't conceive and then the Lord gave her a child and then... Um, she was to give that child up so he would go into service to God the Father. And when she did conceive, and when she did um, finally have this baby boy, she said these words, There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. That is a prayer that comes out of great heartache, that has been redeemed by the Father. So however you come to this Mother's Day celebration today, whatever is in your heart, there's no rock like our God. And he's able to redeem even the worst of situations. And as we pray, we want to remember in particular um, our friend and brother, uh, Todd Miller. Todd's mom is dying. She's going into hospice today. And Todd is down in Omaha with her, but um, she is... Uh, going through, uh, many of her organs are starting to fail. And so this is most likely the end for Todd's mom. So on this Mother's Day, he's grieving as he sits by his mom's bedside. So would you just pray with me? Father, you are our rock. You are the one that is our constant on this day, whether we come into this place with hearts that are just overflowing with gratitude for our mom, or gratitude to be a mom, or we come into this place with different feelings about that word mom, maybe painful feelings, we come before you because you are a and our Redeemer. And Father, I pray that you would be the source of all joy for those who feel joy today and that you would be a great comfort to those who need comfort today. And I am so grateful that in your providence you created women. I'm grateful that our faith family is filled with mothers of all stripes, biological mothers, and spiritual mothers. And today we just rejoice in your plan and the way that you have created the world and made male and female. Father, in particular, our hearts are grieved to learn of Todd's um, mom's imminent passing. We pray for Sherry. Pray that her eyes would be set upon you and that if indeed this is her time to go, that it would happen quickly and peacefully. Father, give Todd your strength and the rest of Todd's family who are there your strength. Comfort them in this time as they walk through the valley of the shadow of death and help them to know that they need not fear any evil in that valley because you are with them. 
your rod and your staff for comfort to them. And Lord, now as we turn our attentions onto the reading and teaching of your word in Matthew 17, I pray that you would bless this. These are your words. They're not mine. They're not ours. We want to think your thoughts. We want to proclaim your words. We want to be transformed by what you have written. So please, Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight because we know that you are our God and our rock and our redeemer. We are dependent upon you, Lord, to teach us. And it's in the name of Jesus, the crucified and risen one, that we pray all these things. Amen. Well, this time the children, wait, is there children's church today? Yes. Yes? Okay. <laughs> the children are dismissed for children's <laughs> church. <laughs> Spoken with authority. So, so you can go at this time. And I would invite you to take your Bibles, um, if you have them. If you don't, they're underneath your chairs somewhere, red or black. Open it to Matthew chapter 17. It's page 991 in my Bible. Matthew chapter 17, and please stand if you are able. Matthew 17, beginning at verse 1. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with them. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. You may be seated. There's a legend about Elvis Presley that um, a specific thing happened to him when he was frequenting his favorite steakhouse. He liked to go to Lil Thompson's Steakhouse in, um, in Tennessee. He was good friends with the owner. The owner would give him free food. That's a great place to go if you get free food. And so once the owner, to try to drum up more business, decided to have an Elvis Presley impersonator competition. And this was the height of Elvis's fame. And Elvis decided to come to the competition. And there he sat, dressed in full Elvis regalia. And he turned to the owner and said, um, the, the quote that I heard is, I'm going to mash this. I don't know what that means, but I think it means he's going to do a good job. He's going to get into the competition. The owner said, no, no, don't do it, because when they figure out who's really here, it's going to go crazy. He said, no, 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 I'm going, to, I'm going to get into the competition. So he was one of the participants, and he sang. I don't know what he's saying. This account says, love me tender, but other ones say it's different things. He sang his song, and there was kind of a, a polite applause. And when it all was said and done, the real Elvis took third place. <laughs> I mean, can you even imagine a, a packed steakhouse full of rabid Elvis fans hearing him sing a song like Love Me Tender, and um, they don't even know that it's him. They pick someone else because they can't tell it's Elvis. I mean, people are not the most observant of creatures. Have you noticed this? 
We're distracted by a lot of things. Distracted by our own desires, distracted by our own perceptions of reality, distracted by our own ideas. So much so that it is common that we um, neglect to see what's right under our noses. And this is especially true, unfortunately, of Christians with Jesus. Because we all have these ideas of who Jesus is. What's important to him. And he's so familiar to our culture in general that people, even if they don't identify as a Christian, it, use him to endorse whatever it is they think is true and honorable. So he's the trump card for everybody. Have you ever noticed that? So there's the Republican Jesus. Jesus is for small government and fiscal responsibility. And there's the Democrat Jesus. He's for giving handouts to the poor and social programs. And the environmental Jesus. Jesus is for taking care of the planet. And on and on and on and on and on. Jesus is whatever you think is true and honorable and good. If you pay attention to modern debates, it would seem that Jesus is the patron saint of every modern cause because he's used all the time. But the problem is that he can't be for all the things that people say that he's for. And so who is he, really? Who is this man, Jesus? This is part of the reason that we're spending so much time on Matthew's gospel because Matthew is all about Jesus, about the arrival of King Jesus and that he's established his kingdom on planet Earth. And in Matthew, he uses the phraseology of kingdom to mean those who are entered into discipleship with Jesus. They're a part of the kingdom. And we've just come through the turning point of the whole book in Matthew chapter 16, where we spent three weeks talking about the fact that Jesus has been unveiled before his disciples. The first part of the unveiling is that he's actually the Messiah the Son of the living God. And then, even more surprising that He is the Messiah was this unveiling that the Messiah has come to suffer and to die at the hands of the religious people in Jerusalem and then be raised from the dead. And while the disciples are trying to wrap their head around that little tidbit of information, Jesus turns to the third piece of the unveiling and He says, anyone who wants to follow after Me has to deny themselves and has to be willing to suffer with Me. And I don't know if you found these messages to be easy. I don't. I, I think they've been exceedingly hard. What we've been trying to get to is the fact that as hard as they are for us to, to deal with, they're even more difficult for the disciples who believed that Jesus was a conqueror and a great, great world leader. It was so surprising that Peter tried to tell Jesus that he was wrong. Do you remember this? And Jesus had to rebuke Peter and say that he was thinking Satan's thoughts and speaking Satan's words. And so the text that we're looking at today actually takes place roughly a week after Jesus has been unveiled. So the disciples have had several days to process and think on this. And in the midst of this time, Jesus takes three of them on a prayer retreat. We know that because this account actually is, um, is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so Luke tells us that it's a prayer retreat. There's some little tidbits that the other, others mention that Matthew doesn't. They're on the top of the mountain. So in chapter 17, verse 1, it says, After six days, which, by the way, Luke says after eight days, and, and a lot of people will use this to say that the Bible is untrustworthy, and the problem is that they're trying to read it through a uh, Western English mind. Um, so Matthew's actually the most accurate of them. Luke is using a phrase, eight days, which means a week. So in, in the Jewish mind, if you said eight days, what you meant was about a week. That's all he's doing, he's using a phrase, so there's no contradiction whatsoever. So it says, After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up high into a mountain by themselves. Now, if you look back at the beginning of, of chapter 16, you remember that they have gone all the way north to this place called Caesarea Philippi that is in the foothills of Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is about 10,000 feet. It, it's incredibly visible from the Galilee region, and it's a snow capped mountain most of the year because it's so high. So they've been up here in this region of Caesarea Philippi, and they're going to go back down to Capernaum, which is going to happen after the text we're looking at today. They eventually make their way to Capernaum, which only really leaves one mountain that they probably were on, and that is right here. It's called Mount Mirin. It's just under 4,000 feet tall, so it's the tallest mountain in Israel proper because Mount Hermon is not in Israel. So we know that they're probably on the top of this mountain. It's, it's, it's a mountain that is, is beautiful and peaceful and quiet, a great place to go and pray. 
But Jesus has a lot more in mind than simply time away praying. He's going to actually use this mountaintop to cement in the disciples' hearts who he really is. These guys have spent two and a half years with Jesus. And even though they're devoted to him, and even though they're massive fans of him, they still are struggling in a major way to see who Jesus really is. So they need something to jolt them out of their ideas, so you see, out of their perceptions. If Jesus were doing an impersonating contest, they would not pick him at this point, because they don't really know who he is. So we jump into the text, and the first thing we get to see is this life-changing vision that Jesus gives to them. Look at verse 2. It says, And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. So, when we talk about the word transformation, as Christians, usually we're talking about something that's inward, right? This is a fundamental reality of being a Christian, is that you begin to change from the inside out. Even Jesus taught that. Your heart changes and it works its way out. And so if you're an angry person, you become less angry. And all these things begin to happen to you. There's another way that we think about transformation, and that's kind of um, what happens to a caterpillar when it forms its cocoon and then it becomes a butterfly. We would call this a metamorphosis, correct? That it is something and it changes into something that's just fundamentally different. The word that, that Matthew uses here is metamorpheo. It's where we get metamorphosis from. What it means is radical alteration or change. And this is the idea here. It's, it's not so much this inward heart change transformation. He's talking about a radical alteration of who Jesus is. So Mark and Luke tell us that while Jesus was praying, the other three, they, had fell, they fell asleep. This is kind of a common thing. Jesus prays, they sleep. They're all supposed to be praying, but they fell asleep. And they're deep in their slumber when this bright, luminous light wakes them up. You all know what it's like if you're in your room asleep and someone turns the light on and you're irritated, like, who did that? Why? That, that hurts my eyes. So imagine that, that, that these three are fast asleep. And all of a sudden, this incredibly bright light assaults their senses and they wake up at first irritated and then they realize that this light is actually coming from Jesus' face and clothes. Imagine the face that for two and a half years you've grown accustomed to. You've sat across a campfire from this face of love and gentleness and, and you love everything about him. And now you wake up and you can't even look at this face because it is as bright as the sun. Jesus' form is unapproachable and he's allowing them to see a glimpse of his true form. You ever wrap your head around that? This is exactly what Peter and James and John are experiencing, and they're terrified by it. And you know how you can't look at the sun, so you kind of look to the side? Or there's a bright light, and you kind of try to look to the side, and as they do that, all of a sudden they see that Jesus is actually talking with two individuals, Moses and Elijah. And you may ask the question that everyone wants to know. How in the world do they know it's Moses and Elijah? Here is the answer. I don't know. Nobody does. We just are told that they know. You know, Will says maybe they have nameplates or little badges that say Moses. Uh, they know. They just know who Moses and Elijah are. And then the next question that, that, that is, is reasonable is why Moses and why Elijah? And we could spend a whole sermon on why Moses and why Elijah, so we'll do that. Let's do the 30-second version. Moses, the greatest leader in Israel's history, correct? The guy that led the children of Israel out of Egypt with all the plagues and then the sea parts and they walk through on dry land and then he leads them to, to the base of Mount Sinai where they receive the Ten Commandments and all the law and God makes a covenant with them. This great leader, the first Exodus and what we learn throughout the Old Testament is that Moses was a forerunner of someone else who was to come. And that there would be another exodus, that someone else, 
Deuteronomy 18, Moses himself said, God has told me that there is another prophet who will be greater than me who's going to come to you and he's going to lead the people on, on another great exodus. And so the people of Israel have this hope that this, this, this figure that's even greater than Moses. Moses is a forerunner of someone who's to come and it'll be a bigger exodus that is to come. So that's Moses. He has everything to do with the Messiah. Everyone, when they looked for the Messiah, was looking for a Moses-like figure. Why Elijah? Well, because Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 through 6 tells us that this Old Testament prophet would somehow return. And he would be the, the, the predecessor of the Messiah. He would get the people ready for the Messiah. And so what you need to know is that Peter and James and John know this. Like it was pounded into their brains from the time they were little boys that Moses and Elijah have everything to do with the Messiah. And so when they saw this, it communicated something very distinct to those three men. What they saw was this is it. Jesus is about to launch his kingdom. Do you understand? Jesus is about to go to Jerusalem and kick some Roman derriere. He is about to institute all of it, this world-dominating global kingdom, this Jewish kingdom. It's about to happen because Moses and Elijah are here. Never mind that chapter 16 is all about the fact that Jesus said, I am going to Jerusalem, but I'm not going to oust the Romans. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die at the hands of your religious leaders. And what we see is that they still don't get it. Because they don't even know what Elijah and Moses are talking with Jesus about. Luke tells us exactly what they're talking with him about. It says that um, they were talking with Jesus about his future exodus that would take place in Jerusalem. His departure. His death. And actually what we know is that this is only six months away. This transfiguration occurs six months before Jesus goes to the cross. And it's at this time that Peter actually interrupts Jesus and Moses and Elijah and gives to them a rather heart-revealing statement. In verse 4, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we're here. If you wish, I will make three tents. Here, one, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. So how do I know that Peter, James, and John were confused about Jesus' actual mission? Peter removes all doubt by speaking for them, interrupting the conversation um, if you read Mark's account and Luke's account, both Luke 9 and Mark 9, um, both of them talk about the inappropriateness of what Peter is about to say, that, um, that he, he has no clue how dumb what he's... They don't use the word dumb, but that's really what it means. If there's a nice way to say it in Greek, that's what they say. Peter did not know how dumb he was when he spoke. What did he say? What he said is, is really something like this. It is fantastic to be here. I'm so glad that you chose me to see this. This is incredible. We should never leave here. We should stay on this mountaintop forever. And so he has this idea. He says, look, I'll build three structures. One for you, Jesus. One for Moses. One for Elijah. We're just going to stay on this mountaintop forever. We'll invite everybody to come and see your glowing face. We might need a little veil because it hurts my eyes. But I want everybody to see this glowing face and to see Moses and to see Elijah. What is the problem with what he said? There's a twofold problem. The first, did you, did you notice that he essentially equates Jesus, Moses, and Elijah? Even Stephen's there. He doesn't elevate Jesus at all. He says, look, you three are great prophets of Israel, and now you're the Messiah, and so let's build these three equal structures for you guys. So Peter still doesn't get that this is the one that created Moses and created Elijah and wrote the Bible. So that's the first part of the problem. The second part of the problem is I believe that what Peter is doing here is giving a backward way to again try to change Jesus' mind about this whole suffering thing. So if I were going to put it, my thoughts into what Peter's saying, it's something like this. Jesus, this is the way to earn the people's trust. 
okay? This shining face thing, this, this illuminescence that you're able to do, and then the fact that you have Moses and Elijah here, what you need to do is build these three structures, get everybody to come to this mountain. This will be the new capital, and once everybody sees that glowing face thing, and once everybody sees Moses and Elijah are with you, then you got all the people, Jesus. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. This is the way to get the church to grow big, not this suffering and death stuff. Do you see what Peter's doing? Let's just stay here. We don't need to go to Jerusalem. It's good that we're here. And so he betrays this incredible lack of understanding and this resistance to the suffering Messiah. And he also shows that for a second time, he's not listening to what Jesus has been saying. So he needs a second voice to enter in on this, which leads to the third part of the story, which is an awe-inspiring confirmation, confirmation of Jesus. Verse 5, he was still speaking. Now it's God's turn to interrupt, you see? He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. Like this is a stunning sight. It's incredible on so many levels. And the three disciples are more terrified after this than anything they've seen with Jesus' glowing face and these dead men that are standing before them. This cloud descends upon the mountain and this alone would have been terrifying to Peter, James, and John. Why? Because they grew up hearing all the stories about the Exodus. Do you remember any of your Sunday school stories about what God did when they were at the base of that mountain? And how they knew when God came upon the mountain? Here's a tame version of that. Exodus 24, 16 through 7, 17. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like, listen to this, like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of all the people. And numerous accounts tell us that the people said, we don't want to go even near that mountain. You go, Moses. Cowards. Because there is smoke and there is lightning and there is thunder and there are trumpets and they say, you just go on our behalf. We're good. We're, we'll stay back here. Every time you see in the Old Testament a cloud descend, it's 90% it's, it's that that is the presence of God coming into a place. And for Peter and James and John, this is a terrifying thing. They're enveloped by this cloud, which means the glory of the living God has just descended upon them in their presence. And then a voice thunders from the cloud, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Which are the same words, if you remember, that thundered from the cloud when Jesus was baptized. There's no mistake here. There's, there's intentionality in the words that God the Father is using. Because if anybody who is at the baptism or anyone who is on the mountain, Peter, James, and John, if they were actually thinking about this and processing the words that we're using as good Jews who knew the Bible really well, they would have known that what was happening here is God was taking two phrases from two different places in the Old Testament and he was smashing them together into one phrase. First came from Psalm 2, you are my son. Well, what's happening in Psalm chapter 2? The entire song is what we might call a messianic enthronement song. It's about the Messiah and how he reigns over the earth. He reigns supreme. This is a song that they would have used in the temple to, to rejoice and think of the day when the Messiah would come and he would do everything they expect the Messiah to do and to kick the Romans out and to set up his world-dominating government. Psalm 2. Son of God. Mashing it with a phrase from Isaiah 42, in whom I am well pleased, or the actual phrase in Isaiah 42 is, in whom my soul delights. In whom I'm well pleased is another way to say the same thing. Well, what is Isaiah 42 about? 
Isaiah 42 is all about the suffering servant of God. The one who comes to suffer and to be wounded and to be broken on behalf of the people. And so when God says, thunders from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom my soul delights, in whom I am well pleased, what he is really saying is, this is the enthroned Messiah, the king of the universe, who has come to suffer. Listen to him. Do you get goosebumps? Do you see what the Father is saying and how confirming this is? God is telling these three, stop clinging to your own understanding of who this man is and listen to him. See him for who he really is. And in the midst of all of this, Jesus offers to these three a life-altering focus. Verse 7, but Jesus came and touched them, saying, rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. You see the scenario, Peter, James, and John, they're glued to the dirt. Moses and Elijah are gone. They dare not get up. They dare not look because every good Jew knows you can't look upon God and live. He's holy. He's perfect. And now the same God that thundered on Mount Sinai has thundered here on Mount Mirin. The Father's words are still hanging in the ear. Listen to him. Peter, James, and John are frozen in fear when they feel this familiar touch on their shoulder. Do you see it? It's not a violent touch. It's not an angry touch. It's actually filled with love. It's filled with friendship. And they hear the simple words of Jesus, their friend and teacher. And before I say the words, let's think here. What was the last thing they heard? Listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. And with their ears open, the very first words Jesus says. Get up and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And it's at that point that their eyes actually turn up and it says that all of a sudden they have a singular focus because the object of those words is standing right there. It says they see nobody but Jesus. They have a tunnel vision in the best possible way. How is it possible that with the thunderings and with the light and with the glory that they've seen and, and the words from the Father that they cannot be afraid because the one who can take all their fears away is standing right in front of them. They see no one but Jesus and they hear the words, do not be afraid. The answer to their fears is right there. They need only keep their eyes on Jesus. While their eyes are on him, they have nothing to be afraid of. Now verses 9 through 13 are a little crazy. Here it is in 20 seconds. When all of this comes into focus, when we see who Jesus really is, when we see what he's here to do, Jesus says, look, I have to go to Jerusalem. So I don't want you to tell anybody about this whole vision and glory thing until after I'm raised from the dead. Keep it a secret until then. And then Jesus actually confirms. Yeah, Elijah came. It's John the Baptist. He's the one that fulfilled this. Everyone misunderstood. It's not actually Elijah who comes. John the Baptist came. He prepared the people for my coming. And guess what they did to him? Guess what the religious leaders did to him? They did anything they wanted. They mistreated him. They put him in jail. And Jesus goes on to say, I too must go to Jerusalem and be mistreated. That's what has to happen. Do you notice that Peter doesn't push back this time? Six months later, Jesus goes to the cross. Now, what do we do with this? This crazy, huge, grandiose story. 
Here's one thing. In a room filled with all kinds of ideas about who Jesus is and what Jesus would do if he were here, I wonder how accurate are your ideas of Jesus. If he stood next to your idea of him, would you be able to identify the real Jesus or would you choose your idea? Do you understand the question? <clears throat> Do you understand that Jesus did not come to support our ideas or our politics or our agenda? He actually came to dismantle all of them. And he came to make it, po make it possible for your sin to be covered and for your penalty and my penalty to be paid. Because through that process, what he does is he gives us his ideas, his politics, his agenda. What he wants us to have is him. So what is frightening you so much that you're not willing to let Jesus have it? What's keeping you clung to the ground because who Jesus really is in that way is too frightening? Is it your own independence? Is it your own self-reliance? Is it your entertainment? You don't want to give it up? Your business, your family, your life? See, Matthew's gospel was written so that our ideas of who Jesus are would die. And we would get true ideas of who Jesus really is. We would embrace him as he really is. And he doesn't share his glory. Do you see? He calls disciples to follow him. To give him everything. And do you know what he does when we give him these things? He gently touches our shoulders. And he says to us, rise. And don't have any fear. <laughs> And bids our heads come up and look at him and realize that in him is every ounce of joy or pleasure or happiness that we could truly find on this earth that's found in nothing else. But it's almost never the way that we want it to be. And the path is never as easy as we want it to be. And so what Matthew is saying is you need to have new eyes. You need to see Jesus differently. Because the focus of all life is about him. A Bible scholar and pastor named N.T. Wright, Tom Wright. He's British, so when he talks, it sounds cool. I don't agree with everything that Tom Wright has written, but um, he's a brother in Christ. And he was asked once, Pastor Wright, when you are on your deathbed and your family is surrounding you, assuming this gets to happen, what would you tell your children and your wife? And he said, I would say to them, look at Jesus. Just look at Jesus. And then he went on to explain that. He said, the person who walks out of the pages of the Gospels to meet us is just as central and irreplaceable as he always is. And he's always a surprise. We never have Jesus in our back pocket. He's always coming at us from different angles. And then he said these words. He said, if you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what it means to be human, look at Jesus. If you want to know what love is, look at Jesus. And go on looking until you're not just a spectator, but you're a part of the drama that has him as the central character. You don't have to be a spectator. Come and sit in the pew and listen to a nice message and then go home and wait until the next nice message. You can enter into this real life drama so much better than a soap opera with Jesus as the central character who gets to define everything. We need new eyes. We need new ideas. We need new thoughts. We need to see Jesus as he really is. 
Let's pray. Father, seeing is difficult. It was difficult for the original disciples. It's difficult for us. And I'm so heartened by the fact that Jesus in John actually prayed for us, for those who would not see him. That we would be firm in our faith. That we would have spiritual eyes to see that which our physical eyes cannot see. And so, Lord, would you make us a family of disciples who when we are, are shown ways of thinking about you that just aren't true, when we're tempted to, to believe that the path of suffering and the path of, of, of resistance and the path of self-denial is not an attractive path, that we would say, no, that's not true. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said something different. And regardless of how we feel, we would be eager to follow his lead. God, help us to stand up and not be afraid and to have a singular focus on you. Help us to see your son as he really is and to be undone by it and to be set free by it. And to learn to love as he loved. Father, give us eyes to see. And hearts that desperately want to go out into our communities, into our families. And say, this is Jesus. This is who he really is. Look, at, look in the pages of the scriptures. Look in Matthew. Look at who this guy is. He'll change your life. Can I tell you about it? God, may it be so of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand to join us as we say our closing song. cider benediction um, there are petunias on the back counter uh, moms biological moms spiritual moms uh, mothers please take flowers just as a uh, thank you for all that you do 
Uh, every man in this room would say that our lives would be horrible without you. Amen. Uh, so we are grateful for you. We celebrate you. Please take Petunias home. I think there's plenty for everybody. So let's recite our benediction as we move into this week. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Don't grow weary or faint-hearted. You are dismissed.